Hello, AP STAT students, and welcome to session five of AP Daily Live Review. I'm Darren Starnes, coming to you from Hilton Head, South Carolina. I've been a longtime AP statistics teacher and exam reader, and I'm really glad that you're joining me. I've got a lot to share with you in this session, so let's get to it. As always, there are some materials that you would like to have with you during the session. These are located at a tiny URL address shown here. In this session, you will need the session five handout, the formula sheet and tables, and also a new tool, the inference flowchart. If you go into the tiny URL folder, which we'll do shortly, you'll see the layout of files like so. So let's take a quick look in there because I did something special with today's handout to try to save you some time. So if you go into the tiny URL folder, you'll see the usual list of handouts, formula sheet at the top, and just for reference, the uh, inference flowchart that's new is at the bottom. But if you do launch the session five handout, you will see some links to these other resources that I mentioned. So for example, here's a link to the inference flowchart that will take you directly to it. Bottom line, if you just download the handout, you have everything you need. Another important resource for this session is the graphing calculator. If you happen to have one handy, you can play along as we get to some of the questions. We're going to be using a TI-84 during this session, very similar to a TI-83 if you are using one of those. So what will we learn in this session? Vital resources for the AP statistics exam. Our goals, as in all of our sessions, are to review essential content and skills, to share our best strategies for AP statistics exam success, and most importantly, to build your confidence and maximize your exam score. Our specific plan for this session is first to present three vital resources for your success on the AP exam, the inference flowchart, the formula sheet, and the calculator. And then we're going to use each of those resources to help work through some questions from previous AP statistics exams. So here goes. We're going to begin with some uh, review. If you happen to watch Unit 9 in the AP Daily Video Series, you will have seen this slide already. It's a summary of all the different inference procedures that are included in the AP statistics course grouped by unit in this uh, course and exam description. So we have all of the techniques for inference about categorical data for proportions, then all of the techniques for inference about quantitative data means, then all of the ones for inference for categorical data chi-square, and all of the ones for inference about quantitative data for slopes. If you do a quick count, you can see that there are 13 different procedures listed here. That's a lot to keep track of. So one of the tools uh, that is vital to your success is a way of finding out which procedure to use when you encounter a new question. And that resource, I like to call the inference flowchart. And here it is. This is my own version uh, developed by students in my class in conjunction with my ability to produce it on some kind of electronic format for you. And when we're selecting the appropriate inference procedure, I want to go through a little process before we even get into this first uh, box with the inference about. We'll start in looking at a data set by identifying what the individuals or cases are in that data set. And then next, we'll talk about the variable or variables of interest that the researchers measured. We'll then classify the variable or variables of interest according to the type of data, either categorical or quantitative, because as you see on this flowchart, and as you saw on the previous slide, distinguishing between categorical and quantitative data is the key to getting you to the right inference procedure. And then finally, once we've done all those things, we'll move forward from this inference about box into the correct subsequent box. I think it's easier to show you if we do uh, an example question. So let's do that now. Our first is going to be a multiple choice question, and it says, a manufacturer claims its brand A battery lasts longer than its competitor's brand B battery. Nine batteries of each brand are tested independently, 
and the hours of battery life are shown in the table below. And you can see that, for example, the first battery for brand A lasted 88 hours and for brand B, 80 hours. Below the table, we see provided that the assumptions for inference are met, which of the following tests should be conducted to determine if brand A batteries do in fact last longer than brand B batteries. So as I mentioned in previous sessions, it's really important that you read carefully and actively underlining, boxing, circling, drawing arrows to the key words or phrases in the question that might help you get to the right solution. So let's follow that strategy I mentioned to get us to the inference flowchart. First, we identify the individuals or cases in this particular scenario, and they are batteries. Next, we talk about the variable or variables of interest. So what are we measuring for each battery? What's the battery life in hours? Next, what type of data do we get from the variable battery life in hours? Is that categorical or quantitative? Well, they're numbers, and we're going to end up doing something with the average, so quantitative. And finally, inference about what? Well, we know it's inference about quantitative data now, but is it about means or is it about slopes? This one's about whether batteries of one type last longer in general than batteries of another type. So that's about average battery lifetime. So it's inference about quantitative data for means. On the flow chart then, that puts us in that top branch, inference about, and we go up to quantitative data for means. But now we need to ask some more questions to move us through the rest of the flowchart. Do we have one sample of data? Do we have paired data? Or do we have two independent samples or two groups in an experiment? Well, in this case, we had two samples, one of brand A batteries and one of brand B batteries. So we choose the two sample option on the flowchart going down. And the next question we need to answer is, are they wanting us to estimate something or test a claim? So are we estimating a parameter? No, we're testing a claim about which brand of battery tends to have longer lifespan. So we're going to test that claim. And that leads us to the inference procedure, a two sample t-test for a difference between two means. We'll now carry that back to our multiple choice question and see if that helps us get the right answer choice. So we have a two sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2, or in this case, mu sub a minus mu sub b, following the brands of batteries. Let's note that the question asks about uh, whether brand A batteries last longer than brand B batteries. So that means the alternative hypothesis in the research is that mu sub A minus mu sub B is greater than zero, or you could think about it as uh, the alternative hypothesis being mu sub A greater than mu sub B. So as we look at the answer choices over here, we've already identified it as a two sample T test. Uh, we wouldn't be doing a two sample Z test uh, for comparing population means unless both population standard deviations are known, which we don't do in the AP statistics course. So it's one of these two options. The only question is, it, is it one-sided or two-sided? Well, you can see from the alternative hypothesis that we have a one-sided procedure. So the correct answer is B. So I took a little extra time on this one just to show you the entire process of going through the inference flow chart to help us get the answer. I'll move a little more quickly uh, on the next one, but I hope that you'll start to get the rhythm of the procedure. So here's our next multiple choice question. A town manager is interested in comparing requests for various town provided services, such as street maintenance and garbage pickup, with nationally published proportions of requests for the same services. Each request in a random sample of 500 service requests from the town was classified into one of 10 different categories. Which of the following tests could be used to determine whether the proportions of service requests classified into the 10 service categories for the town differ from national proportions? Again, I've underlined some key phrases there that I think will be important in identifying the inference procedure. And if you look at the answer choices, you see we have five very different options. And we also want to notice that we're talking about whether these proportions in the town differ from the national proportions, because that might affect uh, our thinking on the answer. So what's an individual or a case in this situation? It's a service request. 
and what variable or variables are of interest about the service request. Well, it's about what service category was uh, indicated on the request. So that was a good hint in the problem that the word category appeared because now we can talk about the type of data. Service category, there are 10 categories like street maintenance or garbage pickup. Those are word values, so those are categorical data. So we do have a categorical variable that we're analyzing. And finally, inference about, well, it's gonna be categorical data and it looks like we only have options about chi-square over on the left. We don't have anything about uh, a test for a single proportion. We have something called a t-test for a correlation of proportions, which doesn't exist. That's a made-up test. So it's going to be an inference about categorical data or chi-square. So we go to our flowchart now, and that pinpoints where we are coming out of the inference about box. We're down toward the lower half of the uh, picture, categorical data chi-square. And now we need to ask, are we dealing with one categorical variable or two categorical variables to figure out in the next branching? Well, it was only one variable, the type of service request. Now that immediately determines the nature of the inference procedure. If we had said two categorical variables, we would need an additional question to distinguish between two categorical variables based on one sample of data or two categorical variables based on multiple samples, two or more. So in this case, we have a chi-square test for goodness of fit. And we can bring that back to our uh, multiple choice question. Well, that makes it easy because a chi-square goodness of fit test is answer choice D. Notice that the exact wording of the test sometimes varies uh, chi-square test for goodness of fit versus chi-square goodness of fit test. Don't let that throw you at all. It's just that different people writing the questions sometimes change the order of the phrase a little bit, but all of the key words will still be in there for you. Well, I hope that shows you how the inference flowchart can be a tremendous resource for you in uh, identifying the correct inference procedure, whether it's on a multiple choice question like these two, or perhaps on a free response question like we might see later. The second resource I'd like to talk with you about is one that you have seen us use in previous sessions, and that is the formula sheet. Uh, a few quick facts just to get us thinking about the formula sheet. First, it's organized into three distinct sections that I'll point out in a moment. The next is uh, some of the formulas on the sheet you may have noticed during your course are more likely to be useful than others. There may be some you've used multiple times and others you've never used. And then it's important to note that when you're doing an inference procedure, you have to build the formula for the specific inference procedure. For a test statistic or a confidence interval, you just have generic information, and then you have to put all of the pieces together to come up with the formula. It does include three tables, this formula sheet. Uh, we have uh, a chance to take a look at those as we go along. So once again, uh, this is all in your tiny URL folder that I mentioned at the beginning of the session. Uh, we're just going to jump over to the formula sheet and tables. On your handout, if you're following along, you can just um, click on the hyperlink to get you to the formula sheet and tables. If you need any extra time at any point, just pause the video and uh, then you can catch up when you're ready. So I mentioned there were three sections. You see up top here, we have the descriptive statistics. The sample mean and sample standard deviation are for one quantitative variable. And then below that, we have four different formulas relating to relationships between two quantitative variables. We have the equation of the sample least squares regression line, we have a formula that reminds us that the point uh, X bar, Y bar, or the average X, average Y value for the entire data set is going to be located on the least squares line. We have a formula for the correlation or correlation coefficient. And then we have a formula that relates the slope of the least squares regression line to the correlation coefficient and to the standard deviations of the two variables X and Y. So I'm sure you've used a couple of those, but maybe you haven't used all of them at in equal rate during your studies. The second section as we move down is about probability and distributions. So let's focus on that section for a minute. You can see here at the top, we have two formulas specifically about probability. We have the general addition rule written with unions and intersection notation. 
And we have the conditional probability formula, which can also be rewritten to give you a formula for the general multiplication rule. If we multiply both sides of the equation by P of B, then we get a formula for P of A intersect B, or P of A and B. So we have a formula for P of A or B, P of A union B. We have a formula for P of A and B, P of A intersect B. Below that, we have some probability distributions for discrete random variables. We have a generic discrete random variable, which is called X. We have a binomial random variable, which is called X. And we have a geometric random variable, which is called X. In any case, whenever we identify if we're dealing with a generic discrete random variable, a binomial random variable, or a geometric random variable, we can use this table for some specific formulas for probabilities and also for the mean and standard deviation of those specific random variables. Below the probability and distribution section on this first page, we see some general inference information about sampling distributions and then inferential statistics. We have the generic formula for the standardized test statistic, and then we have a generic formula for a confidence interval. And that's what I was saying earlier, you have to build the formulas from these generic formulas and what's on the back of the uh, formula sheet, the next page. Then we have one uh, kind of on its own formula for the chi-square statistic, because it doesn't follow the general form of other uh, test statistics. So as we move to the back of the page, we have the specific information you need for individual types of inference. Uh, the top chart is about sampling distributions for proportions. So if you're doing inference for categorical data about proportions, this is where you need to be looking for one population or for two populations. And you can see we have the information about the sampling distribution, but then we also have the formulas for the standard error that we would need in our test statistic or our confidence interval. As we move on down, we can see information about uh, sampling distributions for means. So if we have quantitative data and we're doing inference about uh, means, one population or two populations, you know which road to go on. And then over here, we have the standard error, once again, of our sample statistic to use in calculating our confidence intervals or our significance tests. And finally, at the bottom, if we're doing inference for quantitative data about slopes, we have all of the information we need about the sampling distribution of the slope, including the standard error of the slope. Now, honestly, you usually see questions about inference for slope with computer output that gives you the standard error. So this is one of those formulas that would be pretty rare for you to have to use, uh, but it still shows some nice relationships between the standard error of the slope, S sub B, the standard uh, deviation of the residuals, lowercase s, and then S sub X, the standard deviation of the X values, and the square root of the sample size minus one. So you can see the interconnection between the different parts of the formula, even if you don't use the formula directly. So that covers all of the uh, formulas. At the very bottom, there's a note uh, about uh, a situation that comes up when you're comparing two proportions. So you'll see an asterisk further up in the table uh, when you're dealing with these special cases on the standard error. So just be alert to that. It comes up particularly when you're doing uh, inference about a difference between two proportions. Finally, we have tables. We have the table A of standard normal probabilities, which is two pages, a front and back, or a spread in the booklet that you'll have on the exam. And then uh, we have the table B of key distribution critical values. Notice that it gives the right tail area, unlike uh, table A, which gives the left tail area. And then finally, we have the table C of chi-square critical values that you uh, might find handy. So that concludes our tour of the formula sheet. We'll be back to use it. Uh, very shortly. Let's go to multiple choice question number three. It says, as part of a national sleep study, a random sample of adults was selected and surveyed about their physical activity and number of hours of, uh, they slept each night. Of the 183 adults who exercised regularly, we'll call them exercisers, 59% reported sleeping at least seven hours a night. Of the 88 adults who did not exercise regularly, we'll call them the non-exercisers, 52% reported sleeping at least seven hours at night. Which of the following is the most appropriate standard error for a confidence interval for the difference in proportions of adults who sleep at least seven hours at night among exercisers and non-exercisers? Well, here is the excerpt from the formula sheet that we were looking at. 
that involves inference for proportions. Now notice we're looking for the standard error for a confidence interval for a difference in proportions. So that clearly is talking about two populations, the exercisers and the non-exercisers. And so we want to come across to the right-hand side of the table and pick up our standard error formula. If you just know to do that on the formula sheet, the question is almost over. This could be really fast for you. So let's look at what numbers we'd be plugging in. So the first sample uh, had 59% who said they slept uh, at least seven hours at night out of 183 uh, total in the sample. So our sample proportion for that first sample is 0.59. One minus the sample proportion, which we'll need in the formula is 0.41, and the sample size is 183. For the second sample, we had 52% who said they slept at least seven hours at night out of the 88 in the sample. So that gives us our values for p hat two, one minus p hat two then would be 0.48, and the sample size would be 88. So as we look at the options and the formula structure, really the only one with the correct formula structure is this one that has two separate fractions with an, ad an addition sign and a couple of terms multiplied together. And let's make sure they're the correct uh, values, 0 0.59 times 0 0.41 over 183 plus 0.52 times 0.48 over 88. So it is answer choice A. Answer choice B doesn't look anything like the correct formula in terms of the denominator. So it, it could be a little tricky if you weren't paying close attention to the formula over there. Now I need to say a little bit more about um, answer choices C and D, because they start to look a little bit like this other option uh, when, it, when P1 equals P2 is assumed. That option is only for a significance test where the null hypothesis is P1 is equal to P2. Here we're doing a confidence interval, so we would not be using that formula. But you can see a couple of the distractors involve that structure. So you can kind of see where the question writer got their distractor answers. But you shouldn't be distracted. Just use the correct formula, and you'll get the answer fairly quickly. All right, our third and final resource for this session is the calculator. You've been using it throughout your course uh, in different amounts at different times, but I want to highlight three main areas of uh, the TI-8384 calculator in particular. Any model you're using would have these kinds of areas. So first up on the TI-8384 is if we hit the stat button, we get lots of calculational things. Well, if you think back to the formula sheet with the descriptive statistics, that's what this is. This is where you get your descriptive statistics for a particularly one variable data that you might have entered into a list, maybe two variable data, and so on. You can get your linear regression equations here if you have data entered. The second area of interest is if you go to second variables, you can see in blue up there it says distr for distributions. This is your probability distributions part of the calculator, like the second area in the formula sheet. And you can see lots of familiar ones. We have normal, we have t, we have chi-square. We don't do the f distribution in uh, the AP statistics uh, course. That's not on the exam. We do have binomial. We do not do Poisson in AP statistics, and we do have geometric. So any of the types of probability distributions that you might need are right here, and I encourage you to think about using them. The third and final area to correspond to the formula sheet is to do with inference. So to get to the inference part, you would go to stat and then arrow over to tests. Earlier we were in stat calc for the descriptive statistics. Underneath stat tests, we see that big long list of potential inference procedures. I think we said there were 13 on that original spreadsheet that I put up. Uh, the good news is we don't use all of the ones on the TI-8384. So a z-test would only be if you knew the population standard deviation and we're doing inference about a mean. So that, that doesn't happen in the real world very often at all. Uh, so usually we're doing either the t-test or the two-sample t-test, one of the two uh, z, uh, proportion z-tests. We don't typically do a z-interval for the reason I mentioned just then. Uh, t-interval, we don't do two-sample z-int. Uh, we do two-sample t-int for comparing two means. And then we do both of the intervals for proportions. We do both of the types of chi-square tests. We don't do two-sample F tests uh, in the AP statistics curriculum. And 
then we have the linear regression uh, tests and interval. Uh, we don't do ANOVA in the AP statistics uh, course description either. So we have those three different areas of the calculator that correspond to the three different areas on the formula sheet. So it seems like one of the biggest questions I can help you think about is, when should you use the formula sheet? When should you use the calculator since they both give you uh, really important information? We'll look at a couple of questions and then I'll come back to advice on that after we've done so. We'll start with a free response question. This one says, an airline claims that there is a 0.10 probability that a coach class ticket holder who flies frequently will be upgraded to first class on any flight. This outcome is independent from flight to flight. That sounds important. Sam is a frequent flyer who always purchases coach class tickets. Part A, what is the probability that Sam's first upgrade will occur after the third flight? And part B, what is the probability that Sam will be upgraded exactly two times in his next 20 flights? At this point, you should be triggering in your mind what type of probability question is being asked for each of these parts. So before I reveal any details about where we're gonna go, I hope that as I was reading those, you already have formed an opinion about what type of probability question part A is referring to and what type of probability question part B is referring to. That's what you really wanna be doing as you come down the home stretch, getting ready for the AP exam. So let's take a look at part A on its own. This is the one that asks, what's the probability that Sam's first upgrade will occur after the third flight? Let's let the variable y equal the number of flights Sam makes until he gets his first upgrade. You do need to be able to define your random variable like this when you're showing your work. Uh, that's something that you uh, should be expected to do on a free response question. Define your variable if it's not defined for you. And then once you've defined it, explain what you're trying to uh, figure out relating to that random variable. So in this case, uh, we know y is a geometric random variable because we're waiting until Sam gets that first upgrade and we're counting the number of flights until he gets that first upgrade. The geometric random variable measures the number of trials up to and including the first success, which Sam would definitely view as an upgrade. So what we want to find is the probability that this geometric random variable y is greater than three that the first upgrade for Sam occurs after the third flight. So sometime fourth flight, fifth flight, et cetera. Well, we can reach for our formula sheet potentially. And if we reach for the formula sheet, we can look for that probability section that we saw earlier. So let me just page back up real quick. You remember the probability section was here at the uh, start of the document. We just have to figure out if we're dealing with, uh, well, we know we're dealing with a geometric distribution, don't we? So we can use that row of the table to get what we need. So I'm going to just use this excerpt uh, for, for our calculations. Uh, we know we're doing a geometric random variable, so we can look in that bottom part of the table. And we have the formula down here for the probability that a variable is equal to a specific number but we want the probability of y being greater than three. So that means y could be four or five or six, or actually it could take Sam an indefinite number of flights before he gets that first upgrade if he's really unlucky. So that doesn't seem very efficient to use the formula that many times. I wonder if you can think of a way that would allow us to use the formula, but with fewer calculations. If you said complement rule, or find the opposite of what they asked, that might be a really good strategy. So instead of finding the probability that y is greater than three, we could do the probability that y is less than or equal to three, that he gets his upgrade within the first three flights, and then subtract that from one. Because then we would just have to use the geometric probability formula down here three times, and we would quickly get to an answer. So let's do that. We'll just plug in the value for the probability of a failure, which is 0.9, that he doesn't get an upgrade. And then the probability of success is 0.1. So the probability he gets an upgrade on the first flight is 0.1. The probability he gets his first upgrade on the second flight means he did not get an upgrade on the first flight. That's 0.9 to the one. And then he did get an upgrade on the second flight. So that's times 0.1. And for the uh, first upgrade occurring on the third flight, it's the first two flights, no upgrade, the third flight, 
upgrade. And if we do the arithmetic there, we get 0.729. So that's definitely a viable option. The work is clearly shown. No exam reader could object to the things that we've written down here. In fact, they'd quite like it. Well, here's another alternative. You could use the calculator, right? It has that menu about uh, distributions and probabilities. So we could use the same approach, but instead of writing down all the formula information, we could use a calculator command like geometric CDF. But notice anytime I'm gonna use a calculator command as work on my free response uh, questions, I'm gonna show the labels that go with each of the inputs to the command that lets the reader know that I'm aware that the probability of success on each trial is 0.1 and that the value I'm interested in is three. Without that labeling, you're not gonna get credit uh, for just a naked calculator command with no P and no X value. So if we go into the menu for the distributions, here's the geometric CDF that shows you the probability of getting uh, your first success in less than or equal to three flights. And if we go ahead and do the arithmetic again, we get one minus 0.271 or 0.729. You have to show your work on a probability question, whatever your work entails. And a calculator command with no labeling of inputs will not be sufficient for showing work. But in terms of which way is the better way, well, the calculator could be much faster if you're comfortable with it. And it could be more accurate if you uh, are trying to do multiple calculations. On the other hand, on a multiple choice question, you might be forced to look at a formula like this is one of the multiple choice options. So on the free response, you have a little more latitude as long as you show your work to do whichever one you feel more confident will give you the correct answer. Let's look at part B. This was the one where it asks, what's the probability that Sam will be upgraded exactly two times in his next 20 flights? We have the same two options. Formula sheet would be the first option. So let's let X equal the number of times Sam will be upgraded to first class in his next 20 flights. We are defining the variable since it was not defined in the question. We're going to tell what type of variable it is and what its parameters are. So x is a binomial random variable with n equals 20 and p equals 0.1. And then we want to find the probability that x is 2. So let's consider the option to use the formula sheet. I've already shown you where it is. Uh, so we'll now look at the binomial uh, probability formula shown in the middle of that box. And we can just plug into the formula. Probability x equaling 2 is the number of combinations 20 choose 2 times 0 0.10 squared times 0 0.90 to the 18th. And if we do the arithmetic on our calculator, we get 0 0.2852. That seems pretty straightforward. If you're comfortable with the formula, it's fairly quick and easy. However, there's that other option, use the calculator. We know there's a binomial uh, probability function in there. So we could do probability x equaling 2 is the binomial PDF, the probability density function, trials 20, p.1, x value 2. Those are the inputs uh, that we actually type into the calculator command. And then we get the answer 0.2852. Again, you know how well you use the calculator and how confident you are with picking out the menu options versus using the formula sheet. Multiple values tend to push me toward the calculator. Single values, I am tempted to at least write down the formula uh, and then maybe use the calculator to do the computation. You get a double check that way. All right, so we're going to conclude here by putting all of these three vital resources together. Uh, number one, the inference flowchart. Number two, the formula sheet. And number three, the calculator. So I want to illustrate how they can work in tandem. First, with a multiple choice question. A state educational agency was concerned that the salaries of public school teachers in one region of the state, region A, were higher than the salaries in another region of the state, region B. The agency took two independent random samples of salaries of public school teachers, one from region A and one from region B. The data are summarized in the table below. You can see we have the summary statistics for each of the two regions. Assuming all conditions for inference are met, do the data provide convincing statistical evidence that the salaries of public school teachers in Region A are on average 
greater than the salaries of public school teachers in Region B. Well, an individual or case here would be a public school teacher. Our variable of interest would be salary. What type of variable is that? It's quantitative, numerical data we can average. And so we want to do inference about quantitative data for means. Off to the flow chart. To put us on the top branch. Are we doing one sample, paired data, or two samples? This was two samples, two different regions. Are we trying to estimate a parameter or test a claim? They wanted us to test whether the average salaries in the two areas are the same. Or we'll go back to the alternative hypothesis in a minute. And so we'll do another two sample t-test for a difference in means. We know the type of test now, so that means we can think about how to do the calculations. Our null hypothesis is no difference in the means, and it asked us for the alternative, whether the uh, salaries in region A are on average higher than the salaries in region B. So we have a one-sided test there. And now we can think about using our second resource, the formula sheet, in order to calculate the appropriate test statistic, because we know the conditions are uh, told to be met. So we can go look up the generic standardized test statistic that we looked at, and we can plug in the appropriate numbers here uh, using the equation on the second page of the formula sheet. And if we do that, we get a, a standardized test statistic of t equals 2.048. There's just one problem. The degrees of freedom for a two-sample t-test are fractional, and they use a formula that's really nasty. This is clearly a case where we should not use the formula sheet to try to figure out the p-value, because we don't really know the correct degrees of freedom. So instead, let's use the calculator resource. We can put all of the summary statistics into our stat tests menu for two-sample t-test, as you see here. We can run the test, and it will quickly output that T statistic we calculated hard, the hard way by formula, the p value of 0 0.0213, and the degrees of freedom. That's that crazy fractional number, 123.1. So, as we look at the answer choices, we're looking for something with uh, a p value between point, uh, 0.01 and 0.05 would be where we are because our p value is 0 0.02. So, there is evidence. Uh, at the significance level of alpha equals 0.05, but not alpha equals 0.01, answer choice C. So you can see where the options come together, but you can also see where you have to make that decision on the fly of which tool is the one that's going to be most beneficial for you. One last question, a free response to show you how they, all three of these vital resources fit together. A researcher believes that treating seeds with certain additives before planting can enhance the growth of plants. An experiment to investigate this is conducted in a greenhouse. From a large number of Roma tomato seeds, 24 seeds are randomly chosen, and two are assigned to each of 12 containers. One of the two seeds is randomly selected and treated with the additive. The other seed serves as a control. Both seeds are then planted in the same container. The growth in centimeters of each of the 24 plants is measured after 30 days. These data were used to generate the partial computer output shown below. Graphical displays indicate that the assumption of normality is not unreasonable. So that's one of our conditions that we need for doing the inference procedure. Construct a confidence interval for the mean difference in growth in centimeters of the plants from the untreated and treated seeds. Be sure to interpret this interval. First thing, let's make sure we've got the right inference procedure using the flowchart. Our individual or case here is a seed, our variable or variable of, of interest is growth in centimeters. What type of data? It's quantitative, numerical, that we can find averages. And so we're going to do inference about quantitative data for means. Well, we've been down that road of the flow chart before. That's the top one. One sample, paired data or two samples. Do you remember they put two seeds in each pot? That's going to be paired data. Each of those two seeds, one got the uh, treatment, one got the be the control. So we've got paired data. Did they want us to estimate something or test a claim? They wanted a confidence interval, so that's an estimate. So that means we need a 
paired t-interval or a one-sample t-interval for mu difference. So that's what we'll go back and, and do, a paired t-interval for the mean difference. Our second resource would be the formula sheet. We already know that we have uh, the assumption of normality being not unreasonable. We also have random assignment of the treatments in this experiment. So we can use the uh, generic formula for the confidence interval, statistic plus or minus critical value times standard error statistic. And if we do that, and we look up the appropriate standard error over on the formula sheet, that would be on the second page for means, here's the standard error for one population of differences, as in this case. There it is. And so we could build the formula ourselves. It's the observed sample mean difference plus or minus the critical value from a t distribution times the standard error of the statistic. And I keep mentioning differences because that's what the data involve. Uh, it's the differences we're analyzing. So let's focus on that row of the summary statistics table. And we can plug in the things we know. The mean is negative 2.015. The standard deviation is 1.163. And the sample size was 12. Now, it didn't give us a confidence level, which is unusual. Most questions will. So let's default to a 95% confidence level. What's our degrees of freedom? Well, it's the sample size minus one in the case of a one sample situation. So that's 11. And that would give us a T statistic from the table. If we're gonna use the formula sheet, we have to go to the table, look up 11 degrees of freedom and look for a tail area of 0 0.025 for 95% in the middle, 5% in the two tails, that would be 2.5% only in the right tail. So that's where we're getting the 2.201 from the formula sheet. And if we do the arithmetic, notice that we get uh, a nice interval uh, with all negative values. So there is some evidence for uh, the effectiveness of this particular treatment. Of course, we don't have to use the formula sheet. We could use the calculator. So how would we do that? We would go to our stat test menu. We would put in the summary statistics for the differences like you see there. And then we would run the T interval for the one sample of differences. And we would get uh, an interval that looks very similar to the one we got with the, uh, the formula sheet. This one's a little more uh, accurate because we didn't round like we would have in the previous calculation. So again, weighing these two, I would be tempted very strongly to use the calculator's uh, t-interval function because it's a lot quicker. And in the free response questions, pacing is something that can be an issue. So anything that is more likely to get you a correct answer and save you time seems like a win-win. So what should we take away from, uh, from this video? Well, remember, our first goal is always to uh, review essential content and skills. So we reviewed how you distinguish between one-sided and two-sided significance tests with several of the questions. We talked about how to calculate the appropriate standard error in a given situation using the formula sheet to help. We showed how to calculate binomial and geometric probabilities using both the formula sheet and the calculator functions. We talked about how to find a p-value and make an appropriate conclusion in a significance test. And we went from beginning to end talking about constructing a confidence interval for a mean difference using the three different resources. So what are our strategies for AP exam success based in, on this session? Uh, the first would be use something like the inference flowchart to help you get the correct inference method. If you get off on the wrong footing with the inference method, especially on a free response question, you're likely to uh, earn very little credit. So this is a really important skill. Second, use the formula sheet when it works for you. You've seen some examples of when it might work for you. Use your calculator when it works for you. You know what you're successful with based on your practice in the course, and you also see places where it might save you time and give you better accuracy. And as always in our videos, we want to be sure that we continue to build your confidence about what you've learned so far and also help you maximize your exam score, getting more multiple choice questions correct and also earning the most points possible 
on the free response section. So I want to thank you for tuning in to this session. Session six, Mr. Wilcox will be digging deeper into free response questions and the scoring guidelines that should advise your strategy. And then in session seven, I'll be back to talk about the investigative task, the sort of interesting outside the box question that finishes the free response section in our exam. A reminder, if you need some reinforcement on anything you've seen in this session or a previous one, feel free to watch some of the AP, AP Daily videos uh, that are available in AP Classroom, and you can also look on the review tab in AP Classroom for additional video resources. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope to see you for session seven.